Yeah. Or sometimes during maybe tomorrow during a diet yeah. because I I I think it's like just so much stuff. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. you know what? You can just figure it out. Just send me an email of like how you want to do it, and it's all working and I'm working. Okay. Hey guys, uh, we have a uh, a shortened class period today. Uh, short class period today. So, uh, I would like for us to just fo focus our attention on um, getting more practice for tomorrow. You guys have homework page thirteen, fourteen. I'm just going to check the rest of your packet on Wednesday. Uh, that way I can just uh, focus all the time um, that we have now just on uh, these review pages. So if you uh, can just uh, bring your phones up, if you haven't already, uh, put those up for me. Okay, so uh, page uh, 15, uh, these are the topics that we can expect uh, to be tested on tomorrow. So tomorrow, uh, your multiple choice test will be problems uh, one through eight. It'll be a mixture of um, calculator and non-calculator questions, but I'll specify if it's not calculator that I, if it's meant to be non-calculator, I want you to, I want to see all your steps, right? Uh, but I will specify that and make that clear. All right, so uh, we'll just try to get through um, as much as page 15 through 18 as possible. Maybe I'll highlight the ones that I feel um, may be more challenging or ones that uh, will be beneficial for us to go over. And then whatever we don't finish, uh, I will pick up tomorrow during the morning help session. Because um, uh, tomorrow's regular bell schedule, so I can work through the rest of these pages. 715 tomorrow, and I can also be available during advising. Uh, but any questions about tomorrow's um, schedule or that? Okay, so number one, uh, if C doesn't equal to zero, then limit as X approaches C equals. We talked about how we want to treat C as just a number, right? And what we can do is just uh, replace all the X's with C's and see what that gets us. Oops, sorry, C squared. Okay. We do have that condition for L'Hopital's rule, so now we can find the derivative. Remember, C is just a constant here. So X cubed becomes 3X squared. Anything that is a constant is just going to go to 0. X squared becomes 2X. Now we're free to uh, reevaluate. Before we're getting zero over zero, now we're hoping to get something that is not zero over zero. Replace the remaining x's with c's.
we have something that is not 0 over 0. Uh, again, C is just a constant, so that is a real number. Uh, that's our limit. Number two, 3x squared minus 4xy equals 1, point x equals 1, dy dx equals. So um, can you tell me what's involved here? Because we this is indicating we've got to find the derivative, right? What do you notice that we have to involve here? Product rule, what else? Implicit, yeah, you see y kind of, um, uh, held within the equation here. It's not y equals, not a nice function. Okay, so f prime g plus fg prime for that 4xy. So 4x becomes 4, g stays, 4x stays, and then when we get to y prime, y prime, g prime is just dy dx. Distribute the negative through. And if we can get that dy dx by itself, uh, we can also, uh, now once we're here, uh, we don't have to solve for dy dx first. What I did was I decided, okay, I need my y value because I don't have my y value. So I went ahead, I reinserted that x equals one back into the original equation to get my order pair. And I plugged in um, before I got dy dx by itself, just so that I can merge values a little quicker. And I was able to get all the way down to dy dx equals one. I want to leave some room for number two because I want to do something related uh, to this um, to kind of talk about how you would approach a problem like this. Okay. Any questions with number two? You guys know that? Okay. <clears> okay, <throat> hey, what I want to talk about is let's say I had a problem that looked like this. What if it was natural log of um, y over x is equal to x minus y? Right. How would we find the derivative here? Obviously, implicit because we have y's mixed into the equation. But before we find the derivative, what do you think could be helpful to do with this natural log of y over x? Okay. We have some log properties, right? What log property can we apply here? Good. So you know that natural log of a over b can be expanded into natural log of a minus natural log of b. So sometimes within a natural log expression, we want to take advantage of properties so that we don't have to go through such a messy quotient chain rule that you know can be unnecessary especially if we can break them into easier parts what if it was natural log of a b or natural log of x y how would you how would you uh um take care of that yeah natural log of a plus what not about b yeah so here uh the strategy is we want to do some cleanup before the derivative process sets in so we're not so we're not stuck with such a massively difficult or messy derivative problem. So like you said, natural log of y minus natural log of x equals x minus y. Okay, so now we can more easily find the derivative. Every derivative is going to be attached with the dy dx, assuming that we have a y variable. So what do you think the derivative of natural log of y would be? Yeah, u prime over u, so 1 over y times dy dx. What's natural log of x's derivative? 1 over x equals, okay, x's derivative is 1, okay. What's y's derivative? Get 1 dy dx. Um, I really uh, like having that 1 sitting here 
it's not wrong if you leave the one out, but having that one sitting there allows you to, when you factor that UIDX out, to not forget that there's something there. Um, so now I'm just going to just um, try to get the UIDX by itself. Factor out the UIDX. Divide by that messy um, complex fraction, and we can leave our answer like this. Okay, number three is a nice um, example of calculator question here. It says the function is uh, has an F prime. Where's the where's the maximum of F prime? Remember, we can't just look at. Uh, sorry, what's the maximum of F? Okay, so we can't just look at F prime's graph and see. Okay, there's a maximum of F prime. That's my answer. Uh, we want to be able to interpret our F prime graph. So uh, we sketch out our F prime in our calculator. This is what F prime looks like in our calculator. We can't say, oh, there's the there's the peak. That must be the max. It's asking for the maximum of F. So after we sketch out our F prime with our calculator, we find the x-intercept. Uh, we put it into our slope sine line. We know what we're looking at here uh, in terms of above is positive slope, below is negative slope. So if we're starting with negative slope, then positive slope, then negative slope, then positive slope after finding your x-intercepts. Then you can tell that there is a relative max based off the arrows at 0.511, right? Because these are relative mins. Okay, next page, page 16. So 16, it says, uh, let f be the integral of h of t, and uh, the h graph is shown. So this is our h function. But it's kind of, um, it feels like it's hard maybe to see what that clear relationship is. We know that f and h are, there must be some um, derivative relationship going on here. So why don't we find f prime um so that we can see what's really going on here if i find the derivative of f that means it's going to strip away that integral right because i know that if i want to find the derivative of f that means i'm taking the derivative of that right side so if i take the derivative of that right side all right what does this notation remind you of second theorem right so second theorem we know these will wipe out this is just going to turn into just what H of X. So the big picture is that this is F prime. Okay. And the graph that we're looking at is F prime. And we want to um, think of it accordingly as F prime. That means anything above is positive, anything below is negative. So it's asking what could be the graph of F, right? If this is the derivative graph, what is the original graph going to look like? Let me create a slope sine line and a concavity sine line. And if we can get our arrows and our um, para uh, parabolic um, uh, concave up, concave down the symbols to show up, I think we get a better picture as to what our actual graph is going to look is going to look like. Um,
So I'm just going to um, give some more labels here um, so that I can have kind of more markers to work with. So I'm call this A, B, C, and D. Um, if this is the F prime graph, we know slope zero is going to be where the X intercepts are. So I'll call this B and D. Uh, we know that anything above is positive slope, so we start off with something that's positive, then we go to negative, and then we go to positive. So we know that our actual graph is going to look like this. It's going to rise, fall, and then rise again. Okay, uh, second derivative sign line. Now we're looking for points of inflection. So if this is the F prime graph, where is our points of inflection going to be identified as? A and C, right? These are the POIs. So I'm going to call this A, call this C. Any positive slope, a negative slope, is going to translate to concave up and concave down. So we can start off with this being concave up, concave down, then concave up. OK, so the only um, graph that kind of has uh, these um, concavities that we're looking for and the slope patterns that we're looking for is C and D. Um, so I on my answer choice, I said D, but I think the better answer is C because looks like there is actually a place where the slope is on or the slope is undefined. This is not identified here, but truthfully, I think this is uh, one of those problems where I will give you credit if you gave me either C or D as the answer. So I don't think this is maybe as good of a answer choice as I would have liked. But um, but yeah, that's I think that's kind of difficult to see between C and D. But the picture, but the idea is that if we know what the slope and concavity are based off of this original F prime graph, we should be able to have something in place. Yeah. So the C still look concave up past the K. That's why I chose D. So it still looks concave. So as well, at some point, it's going to have to change concavity, right? Yeah, but it doesn't look like it changed today. Then at then at what point then would you say that concave down starts? Um, yeah. So so you're right. It's it, it's it's kind of it's kind of hard to tell, but then. The idea is that this is technically uh, a slope that's undefined. It looks like a vertical tangent, and it doesn't look as steep there. But ultimately, right, this is this is not it's not great in terms of, um, you know, I would oh, I would have given you credit for for either one. I think is this, this is an AP grant problem. This is this is from a, a publication, so this is not AP. AP did not uh, College Board didn't write this problem. So, so looking back on it, I see where it can be kind of hard to tell. Okay, uh, number five. Okay, the function is given which of the following intervals is decreasing. So anytime I want to get information about slope, I have to first get to the what? Derivative. Yeah, this is first derivative test. Set f prime equal to zero. Find your critical points. Create your slope sign lines. Okay, try that. See how far you can get with this. So F prime, we go through power rule for each of our terms. Once we get to F prime, factor out GCF, find our critical points. So 2x equals 0, 4x squared equals 4 squared minus 3 equals 0. There's a plus or minus um, root 3 over 4, or plus or minus root 3 over 2 if we um, resolve that square root of 4 in the denominator. Uh, we place those uh, critical points onto our slope sine line. We choose values in each subinterval to test. And then we test against our F prime. And then we gather our positive and negatives. So in this case, we see negative. 
slope, positive slope, negative slope, positive slope. We're looking for negative slope here. So in this first interval from negative infinity to negative root three over two, and then from zero to root three over two. Okay, let's do one more here. Uh, let's look at number seven here. Okay, number seven, uh, this is meant to be non-calculator. So uh, let's talk about these steps here. If I have cosine of u, well, first I, I want to get the f prime of one third, but first let's get the f prime. What's the derivative for cosine of u? Yeah, negative sine of u times what? Times u prime, right? So we got to go through that full chain rule or that, that small chain rule process or that full derivative process and then plug in one third and then see if we can get it down to what we want to get to. Okay. Negative sine u times u prime, so cosine becomes negative sine of u times u prime, so 6 pi x. And okay. replace every x with one third. Okay. So we get 3 pi over 9, which is the same thing as pi over 3. Um, 6 pi divided by 3 is just 2 pi. Unit circle value, so sine of pi over 3, that's going to be root 3 over 2. Negative root 3 over 2 times 2 pi. 2's cancel out. I'm left with negative 2 pi, or sorry, negative pi root 3. We got through uh, page 15 and 16, a little bit of 17. Uh, I will, uh, yeah, so I encourage you guys to work through the rest of these pages. Um, we'll practice in preparation for tomorrow's test. And then I'll have a health session tomorrow morning, 7.15. All right, can we get your phones? Can you just um, push line? Okay. Remind me how you do the clips. I could obviously kind of say, you got. Uh, I'm assuming the you put a value there. It's not actually a negative one, or you should take the negative. Uh, I chose negative one to be a number in this interval to plug into my number to figure out uh, what the solution is. So, why is why did you pick negative one? Yes, it's the easiest number that I could think of to the left of negative point stuff. Okay. But you can choose negative two, negative three, negative four. Any number is fine. I'm just always going to find the closest number to zero. I find that's easier to plug in. Right now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You can click on it, but then right, right, right. You only you're only going to be able to intersect if there's two different functions. Otherwise, if there's only one function, and if you want to find the x-intercept, yeah. then you then you have to choose. Um, you have to choose zero. Zero is your x-intercept. No integrals. Yeah, no integrals. Uh, no, you skip pages nine through twelve. And then the very end of the packet, anything dealing with the intervals is out, not until the following two. So we focus on pages 13, 1 through 8, and 13 through 18, you're good. Mm -hmm.
Mm -hmm. I mean, you can do that. I think I kind of understand what yeah, I know that two is my line value. Here's my. I'm I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm I'm sorry. 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 I'm it's either going to be a solve. If you can't solve, it's going to be a guess and check. But if it's guess and check, the question of how you can use like pages 9 through 12. Oh, just like all the Yeah, uh, right. Just 13 through 18. Yeah, say 9 through 12. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, I'm going to be fast. I'm going to be really 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 Bye, thank you. Have a good day. Yeah, <laughs> 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 